Today we talk about the 10 most common financial pitfalls of young professionals and how to avoid them. Here we go. Welcome to the Forget About Money podcast, where we encourage you to take action today so that you can focus on what matters most to you. Today, our guest is Rick Hayes. Rick has been was my office mate at the Joint Forces Staff College. We were instructors for a theater strategic planning course, and we probably spent, I don't know, four to six hours a day in an office together. And he is also a naval officer. So I thought he would be the perfect guest to come on and talk about the 10 money mistakes young military members make. And while this is, and while we're military or ex-military, I'm retired. He is on his way to retirement. This conversation is not, doesn't just apply to military members. It could be any young adult who is coming into a career, who's coming into money, substantial money, consistent money for the first time in their lives. So today we're going to talk about 10 money mistakes young adults make, and I'll go through the list right now. Number one, not contributing to their TSP for the civilian counterparts. That's your 401k, not opening a Roth IRA, excessive disposable income spending, buying an expensive car, buying expensive recreational toys, co-signing loans and leases, loaning money to friends and family, lack of knowledge about credit scores neglecting adequate insurance, and ignoring medical and other benefits. Some of this is going to be specifically military, but you all might also be in a situation where this applies to you. So Rick, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, David, and that introduction of what we're doing today. Uh, Thank for having me on the show. Um, As you said, yeah, 22 years of Navy service that I'm wrapping up right now and uh, moving on to to a new career. But uh, definitely have learned uh, a lot of lessons over the years and everything else of what to do, what not to do in the military. I flew for 16 years before I joined or uh, ventured into the staff world and whatnot. And um, um, but, you know, I've enjoyed my time in, in that world. And um, after the Navy here, we'll uh, see what uh, the future brings to me. Finance is definitely one of those subjects that uh, I always like talking about. I know you always like talking about. So it's an interesting topic to me, even though I know it's very boring and dry to uh, many other people. Yeah, and you're kind of like stealth, stealthy with your money knowledge because even though you knew, like I'm, I'm out there. People know it. Like almost every conversation, unfortunately, it probably leads to some kind of like value discussion, uh, and usually that leads to kind of finances. So I think it, it was, it was months, maybe even it was a while before you even led on to me that. This was also a personal passion of yours. Yes, I did. And uh, maybe that's because I'm not a self-promoter or a talk uh, like to talk about money too much, which is probably a flaw of mine because I do have a lot of knowledge in my head of money and lessons that I've learned from my dad growing up, who's still alive and 81 and, and kicking and uh, very healthy and happy. So, um, you know, I'd love to, uh, follow the path of, uh, his, um, life choices and everything else. And my mom also. Um, but yeah, I think uh, money a lot of times is one of those topics where people get nervous talking about because people can get offended quickly when you say, well, you shouldn't spend money on that. You should do this, not that. People don't like being told what to do. They need to make their own choices. Um, so a lot of times I think, Getting into that money conversation, uh, I'm hesitant sometimes because of, uh, for those reasons, uh, of people can get uh, offended or whatnot. Yeah. And especially when we're talking about, you know, young people who's maybe they come from a family who don't openly discuss finances or whose parents maybe didn't have good financial habits and didn't, therefore didn't pass them along. Uh, and I would say that many people who joined the military are in that situation. I would say, you know, they say the military is a, is a mag- microcosm of the macro as far as who joins. It's a representative of society as a whole. You can debate that. But what's not debatable is many people come into the military without that strong financial education background. And that's also the masses as well. But it is a mili- something in the military that we've seen as leaders that we then have to go and develop some kind of understanding or at least attempt to 
uh, from our from our leadership positions, whether it be through training, mandatory training, or just informal counseling on the deck plates. And Absolutely. I know it's hard to have a conversation about the future with somebody who's 18 to 25 years old because they just, they're worried about right now. They're worried about paying the bills right now. They're worried about what they can get right now, enjoying life, and which is all understandable, but it's a little bit short-sighted when you think time flies and before you know it, you're at retirement age like we are or older. And then you look back and say, you know, was all that spending worth it? So the point of this conversation, we're going to get right into it, is I think the very first thing that military members can do to set themselves up for success is to contribute to their thrift savings plan. What the thrift savings plan is, it's very similar to the civilian 401k. So when a military member first joins, now they are automatically enrolled into making contributions to their thrift savings plan which is a great thing because before it wasn't that way. And then you had very few people actually contribute. So I do commend the military and making that a mandatory requirement, an automatic requirement. And then you have to opt out. So just as we've seen on the civilian counterparts, fewer people opt out. And then therefore the result is you have more people actually investing and saving for long-term re retirement. Now they're not, they don't automatically enroll you to max out your thrift savings plan. It's up to the individual to go in to the tsp.gov website or their MyPay and make sure that they are contributing what they believe they're contributing and what they want to contribute toward their thrift savings plan. I completely agree with you. And I'll even go back to some of the touch points of um, lack of knowledge of an 18 year old um, when they leave high school in American society. A lot of states are actually creating uh, requirements to take some financial personal finance classes in um in high school before you graduate um ohio just passed a law uh, for example mm -hmm. on that so i think those are great things and then the navy and the military in general also yeah you're taking on um uh, that person into our organization um to transition them into that adulthood and part of that adulthood does not they did not necessarily get all of that, those financial conversations uh, and whatnot uh, at home necessarily. A 401k they may have never even heard of or what the difference is in a TSP and 401k. Uh, but that important part of this new blended system, I think is good. And the fact that if they look at their pay stubs and their pay statements, it actually is in there automatically um, you know, the Navy and well, the DOD, or whether you're Air Force or Army, is contributing to that already automatically. And it is your choice of whether to increase it or not. Um, but yeah, you have to take steps to increase that. And then what uh, they only match to a certain amount. So everybody needs to make that personal decision as to uh, what they want to add um, into that account. A lot of times, you know, 18, 19, 20 year old kids in the military also. Um, you know, they are living paycheck to paycheck. The, the Navy, uh, the DOD does not necessarily pay them um, cash amounts that is um, uh, enough to have some expendable money to put extra money into TSP. Maybe there's a roof over their head. Maybe they got three squares a, a day or whatnot, but they don't necessarily have that extra cash flow to put into um, uh, put into the TSP. But it's definitely something they need to be aware about before they get to that point where they have that expendable money. When you invest in a TSP, it goes into one of a number of funds. And I believe the default is still the G fund. I don't know that it's changed, which That's means true, if, yeah. if you're contributing to your thrift savings plan and you have not gone in and actually reallocated where your contributions go and into what funds, it will be going into the G fund, which is the government securities fund, which is zero risk, but damn near zero return. You're going to get, right now it's high because interest rates are high. When I say high, I mean right at 4%, I think is what you're getting right yeah. now in the G fund. Mm -hmm. But that is not where you want to be at 20 years old or even 30 or even 40 years old. You do not want to be in the G fund, at least with all of your money. Uh, so you want that to be a very intentional decision on how much or what percentage of your total net worth is in very conservative investments such as the G fund. So if you have not gone into thrift savings plan or TSP.gov and changed your allocation, you need to do that now. Uh, if you want 
growth that even keeps up with the market because your 4% will not keep up with the market. It's uh, it's it's merely a hedge against inflation. No, so you're absolutely ahead. right. Yeah. And uh, if, if I can, the, uh, the, the importance of uh, going in and learning what those funds are um, and to be able to realize what your money should be going into, because even though it's showing on your pay stub, it doesn't necessarily tell you where that is being invested. Um, and the TSP program has expanded into some incredible funds that were not available when you and I first joined uh, the Navy. I remember, I will openly admit, I did not contribute to TSP because one, there was no matching back then in the 2000s. And then two, the, the funds that you could actually put your money into was very limited. And I wanted to be into yeah. um, riskier equity mutual fund style of investing in my 20s. And, uh, but that is absolutely available to you in the TSP now. The other thing I'll say, there are resources available in every service. The Navy has Fleet and Family Support Center, and they have classes on these. Um, they're usually 45 minutes to an hour. An instructor comes in and tells you everything about uh, TSP and all of those different funds and what they mean and recommendations on what you should be investing into. Yeah, and, and I'm not sure if these types of funds existed even when I first came in, but I do know now that if you're just a fire and forget kind of person, and I don't personally advocate this, but if you just don't like this stuff and you don't want to do the research, go in one time to your thrift savings plan and allocate towards whatever target date fund is available for you for 30 years from now. So I think they're listed like 2040, 2050. That's the names of these funds. So you can go in and think, okay, when, when will I want to retire? Is that 30 years from now? Is that 20 years from now? Is that whatever you pick? And what these funds do is they become more conservative over time. In my opinion, they're too conservative the entire time. But if you're the kind of person who just doesn't want to think about this stuff, go in one time, put in 100% of your contributions and 100% of your allocations to whatever target date fund you want. Please learn a little bit about why you're doing it before you do it so that you'll stick with it. But if you're a fire and forget kind of person, that's one way to go. Completely agree. And it's maybe not even just interest in the, the finance world or whatnot. A lot of people don't have time. Military, you're getting deployed and everything else. So you don't have time necessarily to uh, do the research, especially at a young age. Your junior tours or whatnot are probably some of the most demanding for me uh, in my career. So mm-hmm. yeah, if you don't have time, put it to put that in that uh, health fund. Those are very uh, standard out into the um, civilian industry also with other investment firms you can sign up with if you go outside of TSP to investing. All of them have some kind of retirement funds to um, uh, for a, a, a target year point. Um, and then look at what that L fund looks like as a broken down if you really want to know what they're investing that into. Because... You're just investing in the funds that TSP, uh, that exist in TSP. Mm-hmm. And the other thing I'll, I'll point out too, a lot of people, when they when I was young, I wanted the quick money and the quick return on investment and everything else. It's difficult to look long-term and think long-term, but that those funds do that. But it also exposes you to some of that quick money. A lot of um, people I talk to say, oh, well, TSP is not going to invest me into Tesla or like some flashy stock or something like that. Believe it or not, go look at what companies those funds actually own. And in the small cap fund, Tesla was on uh, the the list. I don't know if it is currently, but Tesla was in owned by TSP funds. So you are actually exposed to those flashy stocks and stuff, even through these boring TSP government run um, uh, investments. Yeah, and one of the concerns that I heard from not only just your junior en- enlisted or even officers, but uh, even your senior enlisted who should have known better when they were giving counsel to our young sailors uh, is that it's run by the government. Like there's an independent thrift savings board that yeah. runs these funds. So people, it's not like giving Uncle Sam your money. It's just like if you were giving it to Vanguard or Fidelity, it's an independent agency 
who runs and that these is, funds. Yeah. And that's the board running the decisions on it, but then it's still being run by just a, you know, the, probably New York City funding uh, company. I think BlackRock mm-hmm. has been involved in it. So, you know, you know, some of these large funding companies that you would be investing in anyway or be using to get your money into um, exposed to the, the stock market. Mm-hmm. I guess my, my advice to somebody who's young in the military hearing this is, yes, we look we look to our chiefs or our sergeants or anybody who's above us in rank and assume that they have this greater knowledge of money yeah. and wisdom and life. In many cases, that is true. I don't want to say not to listen to them, but please do your own outside of the military work on your own education, particularly when it comes to money. And this is your money. So you need to be in charge of it. You need to understand what's going on. And the military is stressful enough. So your your superiors, they're worried about their job primarily and, and making sure that you excel in your career. Don't let them see the same people who are giving you advice about your money uh, unless you do your own work, own homework, and then you agree with them. Look for multiple sources of knowledge and in, for anything to do with your money. This is your livelihood. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. One practice that I would recommend to people who, because when you go to boot camp, they automatically enroll you. And then you're busy. Like we've said before, you're busy getting your quals, yeah. staying on watch, fixing machinery, whatever it is you're doing. And you're going to be very, very busy. And we're speaking from Navy specifically. Maybe it's different in other branches. I hear it is. But you're going to be busy. So you're going to need a reminder to go back into your thrift savings plan once everything gets settled. So set a reminder, set a Google six months from the time that you enrolled to go in and and prompt yourself to either learn more about thrift savings plan, double check on what you're being invested in. Uh, Because in the past, I've heard of people think they got invested in certain things because somebody told them and it wasn't the case. And then three years went by and then they found out they're still in the G fund and made, didn't make the 20% per year that their peers did. Mm -hmm. And that's real money over time. So know what you're invested in. So prompt yourself, set yourself a Google calendar reminder and go back in, take 30 minutes, take an hour and just do a little bit of research. It's going to be the best return on investment you can do. And yep. then automatically, like in, in your reminders, prompt yourself to say, and no matter what your income is, even if you're the the lowest rank in your group or whatever it is, even if you're E1, E3, go in automatically up at 1%. Do that every six months. If you, Even if you feel like you're going to feel a pinch. Because realistically, you probably will not feel the pinch, not any more than you already are. And you're going to be very, very thankful you did that a decade from now. I think that's true across the board for those, uh, the budget concerns and your bank accounts and your credit cards and all of that stuff. It is time consuming, but I think it's a great thing to do. Mistake number two, not opening up a Roth IRA. So a Roth IRA is completely separate from your thrift savings plan. It's completely independent. It's something you have to do to set up. You have to go to Vanguard. You have to go Fidelity. You have to go to Schwab. Not all three. I mean, you could, but you don't need to. Pick one of those. Spend 30 minutes online. They make it very, very easy to set up and start funding. There are annual contribution limits, just like there is in your thrift savings plan, a 401k, which you don't have a 401k unless you're a civilian, and the Roth. So that changes every year, almost every year. So make sure you double check that. and And if you're able max out your Roth, then go back and max out your TSP. So the order that you want to do this in is you're going to be automatically enrolled in your TSP. Make sure you're actually investing in what you want to be invested in. Then start a Roth, then go back. And once you've maxed out the Roth every year, or you set up your automatic contributions to to reach that max Roth contribution that year, go back and then start increasing your contributions to your thrift savings plan. If I were to go into why that order, it would probably take a lot longer than this podcast, but do your own research to find out why that order of operations is the best way to go. And I'll tell you just briefly, it it has to do with taxation, growth, uh, and your tax deductions for that year. So, uh, yeah, so I completely, I completely agree. And, um, everybody's in a different situation, as you just said, you know, that's your recommendation and everything else. You know, Roth IRAs, there are traditional IRAs also. Um, but when 
we're talking to young sailors here, possibly that are 22 years old, maybe not making a lot of income. Most of the times they're in a really, really low tax bracket anyway. So, or maybe not even paying taxes at all. Um, yep. I think uh, sailors and or uh, um, young enlisted that are in the, the military need to be aware when they file their tax returns and they're getting refunds. Like if they look at their bottom line taxable amount and what they're paying in federal taxes, probably zero um, in a lot of cases. So mm-hmm. why take a tax in a traditional IRA? Why take a tax um, deduction or anything that doesn't help you at all? Put it into a Roth IRA, but everybody's in a different situation there, or whatnot. So you know, I, I recommend to people to look at all the differences in those. Um, but also that Roth IRA, um, I look at it as um, if you want to act like a rich person and see what rich people like to do, they like to find tax shelters, and a Roth IRA is that. You will not be paying taxes on all of that, um, uh, those, uh, those investments that are in that Roth IRA. Why wouldn't you want to do it? Um, so uh, that's my incentive to most people. It's, it's just saying, Hey, you, you want to be like a rich person or act like a rich person. This is something that is a given that, um, any, um, uh, person with wealth, um, would want to do. Um, also, with that TSP part, there is traditional and Roth TSP decision that we didn't really touch on, but it's the same thing on uh, the um, compared to the Roth or traditional um, IRAs. They're just tax sheltered, tax incentivized uh, investment opportunities. Yeah. So I, whenever I contributed, the Roth, I don't believe started until like midway through my career, maybe even a little bit farther than halfway through my career. That's right. Yeah. And so I, I ended up doing traditional TSP the entire time. And I'm trying to think like, if it was available to me, is that benefit the same as a regular Roth? And maybe early in my career when I'm not getting a lot, if I'm able to contribute to the Roth in a greater percentage of my income, is that better to do that? And then like, say, when you do, when your income does start crossing some of those taxable thresholds, then start maybe shift from a th- tradition or from a Roth back to a traditional or to a traditional. Is that what you've seen or just have you given thought through that? Yes, I have. But I, I will tell you, talking to a lot of different people about it, everybody has their personal opinion of what um, um, what the best way is for traditional. Because you could say you're in a higher tax bracket as an officer, 15 years in the, the Navy, uh, in the military, um, you know, you have pretty good income. And, and uh, so, you know, why not take some tax credit there? Um, this gets into a debate on what taxes are going to be in the future. Um, you know, taxes are decisions decided by politicians and, and whatnot. Are taxes going to increase or decrease um, in the future? And nobody can really say that, right? So that's why it gets into a debate, um, debate there. But I also think if you are an investor and you are thinking long term to your retirement, um, a lot of people are going to be in a better off situation and maybe a higher tax bracket than they think when they get to retirement. So when you're in that higher tax bracket, um, I want Roth IRA coming to me instead of traditional IRA because you're going to have to pay taxes on when you withdraw that traditional IRA. Um, the details of that you could get, that could be a whole nother podcast, but, um, but that's the difference there too, of what tax bracket do you think you're going to be in when you, um, are, um, you know, 60 years old and you're in that retirement uh, planning piece. I I will say if some, somebody's listening to this and they want to do a 20, 30 year career in the military and retire with that pension. Well, if you're retiring with a 30 year pension as a 06, for example, you're already going to be in a pretty high, you know, higher tax bracket. So guess what? If you have a bunch of money in a traditional IRA, you're going to be paying higher taxes on that than you think. So the tax benefits earlier on when you were younger in your 30s or 40s maybe wasn't as good of a benefit as you think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there are a lot of intricacies and nuances between why you would choose one over the other. But if I were to give blanket opinion is the younger you are, the, the more it makes sense to do the Roth options. So I would agree. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then again, go Google difference between Roth and traditional 
and pros and cons and all those things. Uh, if you really want to know the difference there, or you think that you might be on the cusp of one of these uh, tax brackets that actually make a difference. Number three, excessive disposable income spending. For many, when you join the military, this is your very first time getting a paycheck twice a month, which means you now see money hitting a checking account very often, something, a feeling that you've never felt before. And it's, you walk up to that Navy Federal Credit Union ATM, pull out a handful of cash, and then either you go downtown or you go out to eat, or you go to the bowling alley and buy drinks for all your buddies, whatever it is, it's a good feeling, but it comes at a cost. So be aware of all those additional costs and what you're not saving for yourself when you do this and your future. I'm not saying don't go have fun, but be very, very aware of the trade-off there. Yeah, I, I call these my uh, marshmallow uh, decisions. And you can Google the marshmallow test uh, out there. It's all over in the psychology world of um, the study of kids that were um, tempted with a marshmallow in front of them. An adult said that they could eat the marshmallow as they walk out the room. But uh, when, if they came back and they didn't eat the marshmallow, they get an extra marshmallow. So it's that, can children hold off and be patient enough to get a second marshmallow? Um, and so it's that psychological effect or whatnot. Everybody has it. And you can get into psychology on another podcast. Although I think psychology is a huge um, a factor and part of uh, financial decisions. And um, I think people need to realize that it's not just a, um, a budget. One plus one is two and I have $2. I can spend $2. It's, it's, there's more of a psychological piece to, uh, to it. And I've definitely learned that in the last uh, 10 years as, um, as I've gotten older and whatnot. But yeah, that if you can hold off on some of those expenses of this, uh, that, that really eat into your disposable income, um, you know, and get that savings account going, um, then you'll have that extra money to throw into a Roth IRA. You'll have that extra money to be matched into the TSP. And so it's all the same conversation there, I think, in, in my mind as to, do you want to spend the money or tuck it, tuck it away over here for, uh, for a rainy day? Um, and a lot of times that gets, you know, just bland and boring conversations or whatnot, but it is kind of, it gets into that nitty gritty piece of decision making. Um, I do, uh, advising to, uh, sailors that are in, uh, financial distress and everything. And some of the things that I see there is, you know, those credit cards are being used for, those uh, expenses also. And then you get into that credit card debt um, and poor decision making, um, then, you know, it, it, you start digging yourself a hole very quickly. Um, when in reality, if you, if you get to a point in your life where it's routine to kind of not spend that disposable income and tuck it away somewhere else, um, then it kind of gets to be a habit, right? And, Go ahead and enjoy and splurge when you can and, you know, have fun when you can with your money. It shouldn't all be, um, um, bland and boring. Um, but those are those hard choices that people make. And, uh, you know, young people do have a tendency to, uh, be more impulsive and, uh, make those uh, quick decisions of, oh, just put it on the credit card. So it comes down to prioritizing savings over non-essential spending. And one way you can do that is by automating. Automate your thrift yeah. savings plan contributions. Automate your Roth contributions. That way you're not thinking about it. It's just something that happens in the background and you can be confident once you verify it's actually happening the way you want it to happen. You can feel confident that you're saving for your future and that you can then, if you want, spend whatever's left over freely, however you want to, because you know you're taking care of your future and yourself and your sanity really, uh, because nobody wants the headache and the, just as you mentioned, the financial distress, because it's not just financial distress. Financial distress turns into emotional distress, turns into poor focusing on your job because you're worried about paying the bills uh, or having your car repossessed yes. or, or, or if we can prevent some of this distress, we not only have healthier mindsets, better mental health, you've got sharper sailors on the deck plates and fewer, probably fewer injuries 
fewer mistakes, yeah. probably better production. Uh, and I'm glad so you brought it, up automation because guess what? The DOD actually creates a system for you to make an allotment to a savings account. Um, and if you, uh, I, with all the automation and everything else, I highly recommend your emergency savings fund should be um, a completely separate savings account tucked away somewhere that you maybe isn't even attached to a checking account that you can easily switch over to checking and put on that debit card or pay off that credit card or whatever. So, you know, if you make that emergency savings fund something that's a little more difficult to get to, um, even though in an emergency you think, oh, I need to get access to that very quickly. Um, most of the times financial emergencies can take a day. It's not that big of a, a deal. So I would recommend having that allotment set up. And then that's kind of your own, your own budget. The, you know, if you, um, have enough money left over at the end of the month, um, you know that you have that emergency savings fund funded, uh, to be able to, uh, to use for uh, whatever you need. So if you're young and you're out there having fun, you might be thinking YOLO, you only live once. Uh, I don't want to sacrifice. It's too much sacrifice for my future. Uh, I, I want to encourage you to think about it a different, different way. When you automate your savings, when you contribute to your thrift savings plan or 401k, when you contribute to a Roth, you are acting in service of your future self. I know it's very, very challenging to think ahead 20 years, but imagine 20 years from now, you look back, which person are you going to be more thankful for? The person who went and spent every dime they had and then some, or the person who practiced a little bit of responsibility with their finances and Think about the quality of life that you're going to have in 20 years, one versus the other. And that's what's really, really challenging to try to convey to young people. But I can tell you, just like you're looking at my face on this on this video screen right now, time doesn't slow down. You end up aging. You, your military career comes to an end. Life goes on, though. You can either do it with money or without. And I can tell you, it's much better to have the money than not have it. Nobody can Number fight four. time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, nobody can fight time. Number four, buying an expensive car. This is so huge. This is the, I don't know if this, this might be, uh, it's probably the most frustrating thing to see at, on the deck plates. You go on a deployment, seven months, you're gone. You're getting that tax-free money, at least for a handful of months out of that. You come back, you've got thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars saved up. Probably no increase in the savings plan. It's just sitting in a checking account. And then the very next thing you start to notice Brand new cars in the parking lot. Brand new yeah. cars. These are people who have no business. They can't pay. They probably can't even make the payments legitimately. But because there are so many dealerships in the vicinity of fleet concentration areas taking advantage. And, and why not? I mean, you have sailors out here doing it. So that's a business. Extremely high in interest rates on these new cars. Extremely high. Embarrassingly high. Yep. And, and it's across the board. It doesn't matter enlisted ranks, officer ranks. It's the across the board, um, you know, uh, people going into that uh, choice and that decision there. Yeah. So I, I lived in an apartment uh, a couple of years ago and one of the neighbors it was a young couple. I noticed he was not there. Usually I see him coming in and out in their uniform and I haven't seen him. I was like, hey, is he on deployment? Yeah, they're on deployment. I see him come back and I made a mental note. I'm like, I give it three days, three days, like it, it might've been four days and yeah. then boom, brand new car in their parking spot. I'm like, oh, I just, if you could just walk up to people and shake them, mm -hmm. but you can't, I mm -hmm. think that's illegal. I don't sure that's, I don't think you can really yeah. do that. I think that's called salt, but the, uh, but yeah, the, uh, the, it's not just the amount of money that you're spending on that car too. Um, it is uh, the, the interest rates and the loans, which I think we're getting into later. But uh, yeah, it's it, it's a com combination of all of that too. You're not just paying for um, the car itself; you're paying for all of the um, uh, financing of it too. Yeah, it's no it's no secret that depreciation occurs immediately, and not to mention the, ever since what uh, COVID, the price of new cars have skyrocketed like thirty plus percent. Yeah, just for your yeah. average price. Like I almost get, it's almost like walking through a grocery store now. You kind of get sick to your stomach when you see like a can of ravioli costing $4. I hope I'm mm -hmm. exaggerating, but I may not be. Like it's ridiculous yeah. now how much things cost. 
cars are no different. They've gone up. I think, I think the actual number is like 30 plus percent in just like three years, the cost of a new car. It's it just is silly. outrageous. I mean, the amount of technology that's going into these cars too is, um, it is crazy. Um, I'll also add on the, if you're the type of person that wants to buy a new car every three years, um, you know, the, um, upgrading to the new car or whatnot, just the transfer costs from selling your old car or giving it to the dealer to trade in. And then you're paying, you know, your new registration fees and sales tax. Uh, it's amazing how much that can add into your factor of how much you're spending on things. So, you know, nothing wrong with buying a new car every three years if you want to live that lifestyle and everything else. But I, I try and tell, um, you know, young and enlisted and officers that, you know, you got to look at that transfer expense also. Um, and it's not just the interest rate. It's not just the total cost, but you know, when you're paying taxes on top of that, um, it can be a hefty um, expense. Taxes. And of course, with the it's more taxes with the more expensive cars. Yep. Gap insurance, which is another thing that if you buy a brand new car and you don't put down more than 20%, you mm-hmm. have to pay gap insurance. So that's in addition to your regular insurance, which is already going to be high because you're going to have to have total coverage. And so you got taxes, you got gap insurance, you got gap insurance in most cases. Yep. Yep. And the cost of registration. And recently I went and re-registered my 2016 Avalon in the state of California because I just moved and I was due. And I don't know, out of nowhere, the person that I was talking to about this, the person at the kiosk uh, where I was doing my registration, they said, do you have a Tesla? I said, no. They said, good, because if you did, it would cost you $1,000 a year oh, to wow. register it. So make sure you actually do the homework on whatever car you're thinking about buying and really understanding all the costs. And that's just the cost, like, and then your interest. Mm -hmm. And what I want you to understand is for every dollar that's going into somebody else's pocket, that's a dollar that's not staying in your pocket and it's not growing for you. So you, you can either pay that interest and those expenses to someone else or to somebody else or some other entity, a car dealership, or- You can build your own business of yourself, contribute to your and contribute to your accounts. And that way, over time, you have interest growing on your side of the equation, not taking it away. It it, it can be a drain and it's way more than you think, because most young people just don't get the numbers or they don't want to do the work. They just get excited that they're going to get a new car. And that can be exciting. It is. Yeah. As with most things, though, as with most purchases, though, it's hedonic adaptation. You're going to become less joyful of that purchase very soon after you would probably within months after buying this vehicle, that joy that you felt purchasing that car, is going to go away. And then you're going to see it for what it is, which is a financial burden and a weight, maybe even a regret. So my recommendation would be cars these days, even used cars, they're so much more reliable now than they were when you and I were 25, the 10 year old cars from that decade. I don't know. We're probably like early nineties. I don't know, but They're so much more reliable. Who cares what your car looks like? Who cares? Does it run? Does it get you from point A to point B? Is it safe enough? I guess safety matters to some people. You know, wear a helmet. I'm just kidding. No, but wear your (laughs) seatbelt. You're fine. Um, Yeah. All these new features of like safety, safety, safety. My opinion is they do that to make you fear not having those safety options. When you're traditional cars are probably no more safe, no less safe than the new ones. Yeah. I think that does segue right into uh, your your uh, item number five, buying expensive recreational toys. This is, I've actually seen this with not just junior sailors, but your warrant officers, your people who have salt you, who've in, who like go out to the desert, get the RVs and RVs, ATVs, motorcycles. And we could talk about just the risk reward. Oh Yeah. Mm-hmm. nonsense of motorcycles. I don't know. I'm going to piss a lot of people off when I say that in the military, it's like some kind of badge of honor to have a motorcycle. But when you yeah. drive down 94 or five, almost every morning and see a motorcycle accident, yeah. it just, it doesn't add up. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. if I, if here, here's my, uh, I'll get, here's my soapbox about motorcycles. If I could sign something, if I was president of the United States for a day, all street motorcycles banned, the yeah. risk reward is just not there. And you can say, oh, but it's mm-hmm. it's just not. You cannot convince me otherwise. Show me any data that says 
Show me any data that makes sense. Hey, you're and, you're taking a freedom freedom away there, Mr. President. Oh, <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Oh, well, I've seen too many people die, and that's why. Uh, yeah. I was a division officer on board the Tarawa and LHA one, which is now decommissioned. And one morning, somebody didn't show up, and it's because they went got on their motorcycle at two o'clock in the morning to go to some kind of all night pharmacy to get some medicine for their girlfriend's child. Mm -hmm. And uh, an 18 wheeler pulled out and he ran right into it. So, oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, so, down one sailor. And, the, and, and I would like to say that this story is unique, but it is absolutely not. No. It happens all the time, all the Pretty time. Pretty common. So much, yeah. so much so that they actually require motorcycle safety courses to even ride a motorcycle if you're in the military. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, it's even the reservists also that get frustrated with that because they aren't even necessarily on orders and uh, they have to abide mm -hmm. by it also. But I think it is that, um, um, that part where the, yeah, the military is trying to prevent some of that, uh, making it difficult to, to do that. But then also on these recreation vehicles and everything else, um, you know, people take loans on these and they're not. Yeah your standard loans that are lower interest rate for a, a typical uh, automobile um, that is your everyday car, you're, you're usually going to pay a higher interest rate on it because it's a, a fun, expendable item. Yeah. So imagine already taking a car loan, whatever loans you have at this point, maybe you even took a consumer loan at this point because of hardship, because you're, of your financial habits. On mm -hmm. top of that, you see your buddies going out to the desert or getting a new motorcycle or whatever it is, and you want you want in on the action. It, it, all these things just constantly drain. Uh, drain your money-making machine that you could be building for yourself. Yes, and absolutely. So my, my recommendation in this situation would be rent. If you love that lifestyle, just go rent for a weekend. Rent an mm -hmm. ATV. It's going to be far less expensive. And if something happens to it, you don't have to fix it. Yep. Well, maybe you do. I'm not sure how that work, works between you and whoever you <laughs> rented it from. Yeah. But, but there's other ways to get that same value. You don't have to store it then. You don't have to pay insurance on it. Like, so, and you still get that same value, which is what do you get for your money? What feeling are you looking for? What, what are you desiring? You can still get that feeling for far less money and far less uh, mental burden and financial burden. No, I, I would agree. I would agree. Our sixth military money mistake is co-signing loans and leases. I can't tell you how many times I've seen this. Maybe the rules have changed, but I, I know that junior enlisted, again, don't necessarily make a ton of money. So once you hit E4, again, maybe the rules have changed. Once you hit E4, you can then qualify, you can then try to get BAH, which, which is basic allowance for housing. And so then you, you'll get people who want to live together, like multiple sailors will rent this house and split the rent. And maybe they can save a little bit of a difference between their BAH and what they're actually paying, which is great, except for... Now everybody's liable. And then what if one person stops paying the rent? And now mm -hmm. you're liable for someone else or someone leaves on orders to go somewhere else and then they stop paying or, or, or there's so many downsides to this. Have you seen some now, things like this, Rick? Ab absolutely. And um, uh, more than I uh, really expected, but um, uh, yes, you're putting a lot of trust in somebody there. And um, we didn't, um, we're not really into credit scores or anything like that too, but this is one of those things that can greatly affect um, where you can get loans and everything else from if your credit score is hit due to um, uh, not paying rent um, or a roommate that is uh, delinquent on that rent. You're on the lease too. It doesn't matter legally. Um, and uh, you're on the hook for that money just as much as... Um, um, your uh, the roommate that is not paying the rent. So um, the other one is, um, you know, those roommates that come in and they're not on the lease, um, they can come and go as they please. And I've seen that situation too. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, you mentioned the hedonic treadmill and the fact that you are used to having this roommate and that you're used to having that excess money every month. And then they just up and leave one month and, you have no recourse to them, but you, your lifestyle is going to have to change and your lifestyle is going to be affected. Um, those are just risks that I think uh, people do take. Uh, but the biggest one being, um, yeah, when it can affect your credit score and affect your financial um, situation there. 
So when I know in the Navy, I don't know about other branches. I know in the Navy, if you're assigned to a ship, you can live on the ship. Yes. You have, you have a room. Well, you don't really have a room. You've got, mm -hmm. okay. So you, you got a rack. Know, <laughs> you got a rack. So imagine this much space divided into three, maybe four nowadays. I'm not sure how, how efficient they are these days, but bed, bed, yeah, bed, no thanks. and like, and a big old room, a lot of mm -hmm. other beds and a lot of other, a lot of other people. So when you're underway, this is where everybody sleeps. Uh, and then, but when you're in port, you can also choose to just live on the ship. Uh, and I think it's a requirement unless you have a special circumstance up until you're like an E4. Uh, again, that, that policy might've changed, right. but that's what it was when I was in. And so I understand that when you're in your early twenties, you want to like live, you want to live an adult lifestyle, like grown up. And part of that is getting your own place and desiring that, getting your own space. If you are meeting all of your financial obligations and if you're already maxing out your Roth and your thrift savings plan, this would be my advice. Just then if you're doing all those things and you still have the money to go out and live that, do it. But if not, tough it out on the ship or the barracks if you're on base or shore duty or if you're in a different branch. I'm assuming that they have barracks that are either free or very, very low cost when compared to renting out in town. Just do it. Just do it. Save the yeah. money. Uh, your now lifestyle I, is actually the pros and cons of that versus living out in town. You don't have to furnish a place usually. Uh, the galley's nearby, which is also inexpensive food. You got a gym. It's not free. You don't yeah. want to. Yeah. So or free meals on the ship, you know, get, take advantage of those free meals. Food is getting more and more expensive out there in the grocery stores. And once again, that's a lifestyle choice of you want to be free. You want to be an adult and go make your own meals or something, but you can save a lot of money eating the Navy's, uh, eating the Navy's uh, food and whatnot. Yeah. And actually I think reverse, like I think stereotypically we think if we're on the ship, we're not, we have less freedom. I think of it, the other way around. Like if your expenses are really low and, and if you have very little to maintain, which is just your rack and cleanliness of the space that you're in, you don't have to maintain a household. You don't mm -hmm. have a bunch of dishes you have to do every night. You don't have to vacuum. You might have to clean, but you know, you don't have, you don't have to worry that, about keeping up with bills. Uh, you know, yeah. utility bills are just annoying if you don't have them on auto pay and then uh, which a lot of uh, young people do not. And then they get backlogged on those. And then all of a sudden they have a big bill due and, um, and, and that can be painful. Um, but it does come back to that uh, uh, disposable income that you have left over available. If it's, you have that and you want to go live that lifestyle, then yeah, it's great. But um, realizing how much disposable income you have, I think in, in a younger age, really comes down to that budget piece, really looking at the bottom line every month of what you have and what you don't. Number seven, loaning money to friends and family. Yes. I'll bluntly just say, don't do it, period. That's a hard lesson learned for myself. I've loaned thousands of dollars out to friends and family, saw very little in return. If you've got it, when I say if you've got it, I mean, if your net worth has reached $100,000 or more, then then and only then have you earned the right to actually give money or gift money to other people. I'm not talking about people who are in extremists. If people are starving in your family, okay, I understand you can help out. However, many times it's our friends and family who don't have responsible financial habits and they got themselves in that situation. And you giving them that extra thousand dollars or that $200 or whatever it is, is not going to change their habit. And then you are very likely just going to be out of the money no matter what they say they're going to do, I'll pay you back with interest. It doesn't now, happen. I, I completely agree. And I think if you do make that decision, which I have also, I've done the same thing. So I'm right there with you. But if you do it, I'm not expecting that money to really come back, even if they say they're going to be paying me back. Um, because one thing I am not going, this is a personal life decision. I'm not going to let money get in the way of uh, a relationship with my family. But family is very important to me. So uh, that's just my personal choice. Um, you know, every family is different. And maybe some people can just walk away from a family and, and, and have that affect their relationships and everything else. And that's totally fine, too. Um, one thing I, I do when I advise uh, junior sailors and everything else, I am surprised how many of them are giving money to family. 
And it's not just a, a sibling. I've seen people giving money to grandparents that haven't necessarily um, planned out their own retirement uh, or even uh, I've you know seen medical conditions and medical situations uh, where those grandparents need some money to to take care of a medical situation. And I mean, that's really tough on somebody to um, be in that uh, position and, and whatnot, especially when a grandparent's ill. Um, but, um, but yeah, I still give the same recommendation of, uh, uh, yeah, don't do it. There's got to be some other way to be able to do it. The other thing I'll point out in that, uh, what I've seen with, uh, you know, young enlisted that come in at 18, as you already said, it's two paychecks a month and it's just steady. You're going to get it whether you have a broken leg, whether you're in the hospital, whether you're sick or not whether you actually do the work or not, you're going to get that pay. And that's a really comfortable place to be in life. Most people worry about breaking a leg and then, oh, I'm, I'm not going to be able to go do my manual labor job. And therefore, I'm, I might not even be able to work my hourly wage job. I might get fired. Those are, those are things that weigh on people out in the civilian world. But family tends to prey on some um, military members for that reason and the fact that, hey, what are you worried about? You're going to get your paycheck, you know, every two weeks. Like, just give me this $500. You get, you're you going to get more of it. Don't worry about it. And it's sad to hear those stories where, um, and I do say they prey on them a little bit because maybe they're not used to having that steady paycheck in their family and they come from that type of family or whatnot. And it's, it's a tough decision for those people to make, but, um, but yeah, I recommend to people to uh, avoid it as much as possible. That's a tough one. That's a really, that's a yeah. tough one. And and I know people are listening to this thinking like, why are you going to be such a cold person and not, not help somebody else who needs it? I know it sounds crazy, but you're probably helping them out more by not giving them the money in most cases. A lot of times more. they are, because I'll tell you what, with a lot of federal programs and everything else, state programs, I just mentioned the healthcare situation. A lot of times... Maybe they haven't gone down all the avenues that they can to get benefits and get assistance in other ways. It's the easy fix to go to the military member that has a, pay a paycheck coming in. So, you know, when they have to put a little work into a bureaucracy of trying to get some kind of assistance in other ways. So in a way, if you don't give them that money, then maybe they do go down that path and they get that assistance where it should be where it's needed. Um, they just have to put a little effort into it. And maybe you can even help them in that process instead of giving them money. Yeah. I actually had a podcast on this topic. So if you're listening to this and you want to like to hear more about that in depth, go check out the YouTube channel. Uh, we, me and a, a few other people, we talk about that. We talk about our own experiences and what we would do in hindsight. Uh, and I think you can find that very yeah. valuable. It's a really tough spot to be in. And I don't want you to think because you say no to your family member or a friend or, or somebody who expresses that they're really in need. And I will say this, nobody knows you better than your family members and close friends. They know how to, they know how to work you. Don't, don't be taken advantage of. It's okay just to say no. And then they just stop asking and life will go on. And then you don't have that layer of discomfort or angst or, or regret or tension going forward with that person, because I can guarantee you. All of those things will happen uh, if, you, if you get in the habit of lending money. Let's talk about insurance, neglecting adequate insurance. I think this is a huge one because um, we talked about those, um, the auto, um, uh, the expensive cars, the toys, all these uh, things that people go and buy. And then they added on costs of all of those to include insurance. And um, insurance is a very complicated thing. Uh, these insurance companies spend tons of money in research and data and to figure out what price they should be charging people because what is the risk? Um, but, uh, and so with that complexity, when you're 18, 20, 22 years old, um, I don't care. I just want to make sure that I'm abiding by the law. I don't get arrested or get a ticket or something, which that's where most people think, oh, I just need to get insurance so that I don't get a ticket if I get pulled over. Um, that's one thing, but it's a lot deeper than that. And, um, uh, the biggest thing that I see is they have the expensive car. Um, 
and they don't have the right insurance for that car. Um, and that's the collision and liability and the difference in those two. Um, I have seen a lot of Navy sailors that um, get into an accident and they don't have that collision to, to pay for the repairs in their own car. All they have is liability because that's what the state law requires. And then they have a loan for that car. And then they're on the hook for the loan because the law protects the lend, uh, the lender, not, uh, the sailor. And therefore they've got a, a totaled out car and then they're paying a loan still for nothing. Um, I see that more often than, um, um, than, than I should. It has surprised me a lot, but people are in that situation. And I don't think it's a, I'm trying, uh, these people aren't trying to, game the system even. I don't know if they know the system and the fact that, oh, I didn't even know I needed to have that coverage. Because when you call these insurance companies up, I think USAA is very reputable and everything else. I don't think USA would do this, but most of those insurance companies want to just give you the bare minimum uh, what the law requires and also the cheapest rate so that you sign up for the cheapest rate. I think of three things when I think of insurance. Life insurance, auto insurance, and homeowners or renters insurance. Mm-hmm. Uh, and But because we're speaking to a military audience right now, we're not talking about health insurance. If this was to a civilian, we would be talking about health insurance as well. So in the military, your health is covered, So or your health insurance is covered, your medical is covered. So that's why we won't talk about that. Homeowners insurance, if you happen to own a house, uh, if, you, if you're tracking insurance over the last few years, it's also skyrocketing. Mm-hmm. So much so that the insurance companies are actually just refusing the right to actually insure properties. Florida, California, whether you're in a in a fire prone area or a flooding prone area, they're just choosing not to offer the insurance. So think about your housing options too. Think about where you're going to buy. It's sort of like when we're talking about the car, there's a lot of hidden costs. Home ownership is the same way. Insurance is a big piece of that. And depending on where you decide to live or where you decide to purchase, and this is with rental purchase, rental homes, if you're an entrepreneur or you try to purchase rental properties, these are all things that you need to be aware of. Homeowner's insurance is a big one. Two, uh, renter's insurance, like we were talking before, if you decide to move off ship or out of, off base into a an apartment or a house, they'll require, in most cases, they'll require renter's insurance. And usually, thankfully, this insurance is actually pretty cheap. It's only, I think, maybe between seven and fourteen dollars a month. It's very, very low. So make sure you have that because you just never know. And it covers a lot. And make sure you understand what it covers. Yeah, the renter's insurance is a big one because I think a lot of people, um, especially in base housing, think that they maybe are covered by the military or something. But if your the house burns down in, in base housing. Um, your personal items aren't covered. The military is not going to pay you back for whatever you have in that house. Um, in fact, the military may even self-insure what we call self-insuring of, for that housing. They may, you know, just pay to rebuild the thing, but they're not going to pay the the, uh, the military member back for things that they've lost necessarily. So that's that the renter's insurance, I think, is huge in that factor of a lot of people think, oh, I just live on base. I'm good to go. Um, but but they're not. Talking about auto insurance again, we talked about autos earlier. Here's a hack. Do not buy a new car. Buy a car that's five, 10 years old or older. The value of that car, one, you're going to be paying less for it. And you might even be able to pay cash for it, which I highly recommend. And if you automate things early, if you decide you're 20 that you want a car, and you're going to save up for it. You just automate to a different account, like a like a car account, yeah. just like you would have saved an emergency savings account. And when that reaches an amount that you can purchase a car that's dependable for you, then you use that money to do it. You've, now you own a car outright. It doesn't depreciate nearly as great as a brand new car or in the significant amounts that one does. And you may only need liability insurance because if you've actually got the financial habits down, you probably have developed, built a net worth enough to cover replacing that on your own. Uh, So then you can actually reduce your insurance costs. Right now, my truck, and I've got money, but I have a 2005, I drive a 2005 Mercury Mountaineer because I 
like to go to the beach and just throw stuff in. I don't have to worry about like dings or anything like that. But I can just insure with just liability because I can cover the cost of replacing it. No problem. Now, that's a personal choice too. But realistically, the insurance company is probably not going to give you what you want for your car, no matter what. And you're, then you're going to be frustrated twice. One, that you paid for collision on this kind of vehicle. And second, that they're not going to give you what you want for it or what you think your car was worth to replace. So yeah, you're absolutely That's a great hack. A lot of people don't realize that you have to negotiate with the insurance company as to what the value of that car is. And I just had a friend that went through it and they had to argue with them to get a little more money uh, out of it. Uh, so Kelly Blue Book and Edmonds and everything else that you see online, that's not necessarily what the insurance is going to say that that car is worth. So absolutely not. No, because don't forget insurance are out, insurance companies are out there to make money off of us. Mm-hmm. And yeah. insurance serves a purpose, but we've got to be smart in how we, or we handle it. So used car, liability only, if you can comfortably cover the expense, if you were to total your car, and even then you can even bolster up some of your other insurance if you want. Um, so that, that gives you some space financially to do that with. Not to mention all the taxes you would save because you're just buying a used car. Uh, you will pay taxes on it and registration. But all that stuff is cheaper on a used, less expensive car. Mm-hmm. More money to save and, and to add to your money-making machine. Another type of insurance that we want to cover is life insurance. For the demographic that we're talking about right now, young professionals... If you are in a civilian world, you probably want some kind of life insurance. You don't need a lot. In the military, you have SGLI automatically. And I believe right now it's 400 to 450,000. I don't know exactly, but it's automatic. It comes out of your paycheck. It's, I don't know exactly what it is, 25, 29, 30 a month. I think it's, it's bumped up. up to like 31 now, but um, but yeah, I think they, they bumped up the amount of 450, 500, something like that. Yeah. So if if you look at your pay stub and you see that SGLI, don't opt out, keep it, uh, keep it for as long as you're in. And then at, whether you get out after your first tour, second tour, whatever it is, you'll have other options. And that's a different conversation. But at this stage in your life, in your 20s, you probably don't have a huge net worth. You're probably in the cu- accumulation phase unless you got really lucky with some things or you got an inheritance. Uh, you will have other insurance needs later. Uh, but in, I want to say this uh, as a blanket statement too. Insurance is not investing. Insurance is not investing. You will have people because, just like we said, friends and family will prey on you. You will have professional money managers, experts that will prey on you as well. And they will try to sell you insurance products, very expensive insurance products, and try to sell it to you as an investment. In my opinion, it's best to keep two separate mentally and functionally in your portfolio. Insurance is for protection against downside. Investment is for growth. You will be confronted with people trying to sell you things that say insurance is an investment. I caution you to accept that insurance is an investment. Insurance is insurance. Investing is investing. Uh, I completely agree with you. Investing, you're trying to grow net worth and uh, um, you know, save for retirement or one function um, you know, for the future or whatnot. Insurance is trying to offset risk in your day-to-day life. You walk out the front door, there's risk associated to life. So uh, I look at insurance as a, a, um, a risk. Uh, uh, they're taking risk off of my table and off of my plate and paying a company to take that risk on to, to them. Um, and uh, and that's why, you know, I've paid uh uh, ins- car insurance premiums, but I've never been at fault in a car accident. So you could look at that as money down the drain, wasted money. But no, it's not because I didn't have as much risk going through all those years without having that uh, that car insurance. So I just I look at them in those two different categories. Um, and the life insurance part, I think uh, the life insurance is very uh, important. I have SGLI now. But that's also because I'm married and I have kids. Um, when I was younger, I did not have SGLI, so I would, I'm in a little different opinion uh, than you, David, on that. In the fact that uh, you know, I looked at it as, hey, that's thirty bucks a month that I can be putting into my savings account, or that thirty bucks a month I can be putting into my investments. Um, and one reason I came to that determination, I talked about it with my dad. 
And I was like, well, dad, what, you know, if I'm 25, I'm not married. I don't have any kids. Like, where's this money going to go to, to like you and mom? Cause that's who they, who was listed on my, um, who would be listed on my policy if I had one back then, but, um, for SGLI. And they were like, well, uh, yeah, we, we don't need it. We, we're, you know, we've saved for retirement. We're, we're fine. Like really, if you died that we'd be more heartbroken and everything else, we wouldn't need money to take care of whatever you needed to take, to, to take care of. Um, I didn't have a lot of assets. I didn't have a, mortgage to cover or anything like that. I, my car was paid off there. I, I really didn't have a lot of um, ties. So if I died, somebody would have to pay or take care of those. Um, so yeah, I didn't pay the, the $30 a month, but call, call me cheap on that. But mm-hmm. you know, there, the risk there to me was um, if I die, then, you know, I, my family, you know, mourns and moves on. And then, um, but there isn't a need for the money part. It's when you're married, it's when you have kids, your spouse, whether they work or not, and then they have to deal with your no income uh, when you are gone. Um, so, you know, that's the way I look at the life insurance piece uh, of that. But I completely agree. It is not an investment at all. What I like about what you said, Rick, is you just went through all of your intentional decisions. Yep. and justifications for why you did what you did. Unfortunately, most people won't do that. True, yeah. So for, mo- for most people, my advice would be, just have the SGLI because you have that one, yep. if you don't think about this money stuff very much, you're not going into checking even that you are contributing to SGLI or, or buying SGLI. So when you get the first opportunity to do it, just do it. And then for most people, unless you've gone through exactly what you've gone through, you've had the framework, the structure, the mentorship of your parents, that conversation, that holistic conversation. Most people don't do that. So for the masses- Completely agree. If anybody asks me for advice of whether they should sign up for SGLI or not, yeah, uh, go ahead, sign up. It's it's yeah. it's cheap insurance. Yeah, because let's like say, for example, you're 18, you join, you don't get SGLI, you're pregnant at 19, you got a three-year-old by 21 or 22, you never went back to get SGLI. Now you're in a motorcycle accident and you die. Uh, yes. And another one of those is, uh, future divorces and whatnot. People are signed up on SGLI, but they have the wrong spouse that is, um, on the SGLI. So, you know, there's a lot of life changing Mm -hmm. situations that people do not think about that SGLI and changes, um, uh, there. I think that's an annual discussion people need to have with themselves as to, okay, What's changed in my life for this year? Well, what do I need to go off and change in my accounts and my um, um, insurance or whatever else to, to kind of get my life in order? I think that's an annual mm-hmm. check every year. Number nine, lack of knowledge about credit scores. Much of what we've talked about already will impact your credit score either in a good way or a negative way. What do you see in your counseling as far as the level of knowledge young sailors have regarding credit? Uh, very little. Um, and in fact, this is probably the driest topic uh, for today. And when a lot of people don't like to talk about finances, they don't want to talk about what that score even means or what that number is or how it's even calculated. There's a bunch of rules to it as to how it's even calculated. If you want to dive into it, those websites are out there. Experian and TransUnion will tell you exactly how it's calculated. Um, so, uh, you, you can dive into that, but I don't think real people realize, you know, when you go into a different range of a credit score, how drastically that's going to change your interest rates available to you when you get a car loan, um, um, you know, go and buy your, uh, toys and, uh, home loan, which, I mean, you want to talk about a huge investment there and uh, you can get a, a lower, little lower interest rate, you know, over 30 years of paying off a mortgage, that's huge. Um, but once again, that's things people, most people do not look at as to how much interest they pay over 30 years on a mortgage. Um, but that credit score is a huge factor in, um, um, uh, in what you're going to be paying on that interest. And if you want to look at it in an investment style of, if you're paying more money to the bank in an interest rate, 
that's less money your that you your investments can make on interest back to you. Um, so uh, it's a huge factor, and most people do not know uh, much about it. Especially, there's a lot of tools out there today. Um, Credit Karma and a bunch of other companies, which I have no association with at all. But if you, you know, that, that make it a lot easier to keep track of your score. And then also, what do you need to do to change your score? Um, and, uh, and most of the times that's the credit card debt that hurts um, uh, people the most. Yeah. From what I understand, the single thing you can do to help your credit score is simply pay on time. Pay what's yeah. owed and pay on time. And don't max out your credit cards pay them off every month if you can. That's just generally good advice too, because if when they pull your credit, they're going to look at your debt to credit line ratio, basically. Yeah. So if you've got a $50,000 credit line on your Navy Fed credit card and you've got a balance of like $40,000, well, the next person you try to get credit from is going to say, ooh, that's kind of rough. I don't think that's worth that risk. I'm not going to give you that line yeah. of credit for whatever. Or if I do, I'm going to, I'm going to jack up the interest rate to make it worth my risk to take you on. Yeah, so, I think a, another piece that people need to realize is you need to have a credit card in order to get credit. You need to show that you can hold the credit card in order to get a, a higher credit score. So yes, paying on time. I know the uh, time of how long you've held a credit card is a factor. Um, so I've held my, I got a credit card when I came out of high school. And I've held that same credit card for that length of time. And that helps my credit score. There's a ton of factors or whatnot that you can, uh, that you can do, but paying, paying on time and, and having that credit available to you are, are two of the biggest factors. One way you can make sure that you pay on time is to when you, when you go to your online bank account, go to your credit card management or whatever that drop down menu is and set up automatic payments for the entire yeah. amount every month. What you're likely going to find out is that you spend way more on your credit card than you think. Yeah. Because you're going to look at that checking account one day like, oh, where did all that money go? Well, I went to pay on a credit card. Then you just realize yeah. that you're actually swiping that card a little more than you realize. And then that will prompt change. And then that actually changes your habit of spending on your credit card, which is very easy to do because the, psycholog the psychology of spending cash versus a credit card is very different. So I'm not advocating necessarily spend cash. But I'm just saying, recognize that it's different. It's easier to spend more money on a credit card than it is when you're handing somebody cash across the counter. So one thing you can do is set up automatic pay total amount every month. Two benefits of that. One, you won't be late on payments unless you don't have money in your checking account, which is another issue that you need to work on. The second is you get automatic feedback on your spending habits. And it, it will prompt you to take a look at that credit card profile and say, okay, Hulu, Netflix, yeah. What's that? A restaurant, $120 at a restaurant. Yeah. Then you realize like how much stuff really costs in the world and like what you're willing to and not willing to pay for in the future next time. And that helps shape your habits in a fun, in a, in, in a very specific way uh, versus just not having your auto pay set up and then just seeing a balance accumulate. And now you're into past due amounts, high interest rate payments, and the cycle continues. And you can see how that just that's a burden on, on your long-term uh, wealth accumulation mm -hmm. in your, in your counseling for credit counseling, do you advocate consolidation loans? Um, no, but it also depends on the situation with the, with, with, uh, yeah, with the, the person. So I think the consolidation loan idea is when people are getting into that bankruptcy realm of um, they're legally in a situation where they're going to have to declare bankruptcy. Um, and the sad thing is most of the times that isn't going to happen until uh, you know, they're in a situation where there's no other choice. Um, but, um, but that's where that debt consolidation um, uh, can happen. Uh, there's a lot of companies out there that will do debt consolidation that are, you know, are going to make money on you. Uh, there are a lot of nonprofits that are out there that aren't going to make as much money on you. So I would recommend to people to do their research and, and homework on if they are considering a debt consolidation um, to pay off um, credit cards. But 
the biggest thing that I see is people that have a high interest credit card and then on another low interest credit card because maybe they got the high interest credit card uh, later when their credit wasn't so good. And they're paying off the low interest credit card first over the high interest credit card. I, I just bring that up as in people need to know what their interest rate is. And most of these companies by law, if you look at their statement, have to tell you exactly how much interest you paid. So if you look at that dollar amount, um, you know, it might be a little shocking um, to people when they do see the dollar amount of what they're paying in interest and what they're paying in principal uh, paying off these credit cards. Um, so pay off that high interest credit card first, and then maybe you don't have to go into a debt consolidation piece. Um, I know people shop around for credit cards too, and they do the balance transfers for these 0% APR things and whatnot. Those are great opportunities for, to uh, um, to transfer that, but then it's probably going to be a high interest rate again if you don't get it paid off in that mm-hmm. um, in that period of time that they're only giving you zero percent interest. So you got to be very if you're going to do that, you got to be very focused into paying that off very quickly. Um, that also um, affects your credit score in opening and closing all these credit cards if uh, somebody's doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, how much it does, uh, I can't really speak to in the details of it, but, um, but I know definitely the factor. And so opening and closing a bunch of credit cards doesn't necessarily look good. Yeah. So I have rental properties and before I accept someone as a tenant, I do a credit check as most reputable rental companies or landlords would do. And I tell you, if I see a car loan or a credit card with late payments or a lot of debt, I just don't accept that tenant. So that's a real life way that it can alter your plans if you don't have good credit, Uh, because there's people out there that will look at that and say, it's not worth my risk to take you on either as a tenant or as a client, if you're a credit card company or a bank, it really does matter. And I think a common thread through a lot of the things that we've talked about is that you think through things as a business, just like your net worth statement, there's assets and liabilities, there's ups and downs to everything, pros and cons to everything. And if you start thinking about money this way and not just money, but things in your life this way, your decision-making becomes a lot clearer. And now rather than just going on emotion, you actually have data and a framework of which to make these kinds of decisions that you can be confident are pretty good decisions. Yep. Uh, and regarding credit, the best way to, uh, to get out of credit card debt or credit trouble is to never get in it to start with. Just don't get in yeah. to start with. You're not, you're not missing out on joy in life. If you don't go buy that breakfast, you're not missing out in the joy of life and living. If you don't have that brand new car. Mm -hmm. And if you do think that, then you, you you got some living to do and some, like some reflection on your own value system to do, Uh, because I can tell you there's the calm life is tough enough. Life is tough enough as is without having to add money problems to it, which I think we're at number 10, ignoring medical and other benefits. When you're in the military, you've medical is covered, but that's not it. You've got other kind of benefits. You get BAH, which is a tax-free monthly payment for housing. You get BAS, basic allowance for subsistence, which is a little bit of not a lot, a couple hundred bucks for food every month. And you got medical insurance, which if you've ever had a conversation with your civilian counterparts and you compared what they pay for medical insurance or health insurance and what you pay, it's you're almost ashamed. And you're kind of disgusted and, and sad for them that they have to pay what they pay. I'm not saying the military medical situation is the best out there, but I'm saying it's not expensive and it's effective. So we've got it pretty good when it comes to that, uh, even, even in retirement. No, we absolutely do. And I think it's something that people overlook when they decide to get out of the military or not. There's always more than one factor in that decision and everybody has to make it, uh, whether they want to stay in or get out. But um, especially if you only have four to six years and maybe you're a high school graduate and you're going to look to be a police officer, firefighter, or whatever that, you know, maybe is not the highest paying a job that's out there. Um, but, you know, you think maybe it's comparable total income wise, but you really have to look at the total package in my mind as to um, the financial 
benefits and that medical piece is, is a huge factor. And there's two um, parts to medical in those insurance premiums you're going to pay every month and then a deductible. And this goes for auto insurance also and any other kind of risk liability insurance you um, um, are paying for. But if you're, your deductible is what you're going to have to pay out of pocket if you go into a, um, um, uh, if you go in for a claim. So uh, medical insurance can have very high deductibles. So you may talk to somebody um, out in the civilian sector and, oh, well, it's only, you know, maybe $300 a month for my entire family to cover our medical expenses and that's the premium. Well, ask them a little more details on that of, okay, well, if you get into a situation where you have to make a claim, you know, what, what, what do you have to pay? Um, you know, what's that deductible? Does it cover your uh, prescription medications? Um, does it cover, um, uh, you know, other wider things that all of a sudden, if you start adding up how much you do pay over the year, um, it could be very different, um, especially compared to military. So it, in doing that budget analysis, deciding to get out of the military, I think medical is a factor that people uh, have a tendency to overlook. Yeah, military life is tough. It really is. And uh, me as a surface warfare officer, I know if you're enlisted and you're listening to this, and you're like, oh, but you're an officer. Uh, look, ship life is tough. It's very, very tough. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not gung-ho military. I'm very proud of my service. And I know Rick is of his, uh, but I'm not gung-ho military. I don't advise it for everyone. But for those who are in or those who think they're going to be in one day, I do advise making data-driven decisions and we're all human. We all have bad days, even a bad year, or we, I've had them in my career. I've, I've actually thought about getting out of the Navy at my 16 year mark, which is crazy, but that's can, to show you how tough it is. I don't want somebody to listen to this and think that the grass is always going to be greener in the, in the civilian world. It is not. Uh, and I, and I tell you one of the art overarching decisions and I'm not advocating people stay in, uh, but I do think you need to think about it uh, as fairly and as independently. And of course, emotions play a role in that. But I remember I was in Pensacola. I was doing, I was teaching newly commissioned officers uh, leadership and I was walking on base and, or it might've been out in town. I don't know, but I was in uniform and this gentleman said, I was in the military. I served and I should have just stayed in because I would have been retired by now. He was probably late forties and that's not the only time that's ever happened in my career. But I tell you what, I hold on to that because it's easy for us to think that we're different than everybody else. I urge you not to think that statistics are statistics for a reason. We are human. We have our own unique abilities, desires, drives, motivations. But when I thought about the decision to stay in or get out, that conversation stuck with me. I had very bad days in the military, very bad days, but I also believe that I was no different than that person and that I too would probably regret it if I got out. Now, taking a step back, there are times to get out if you're going to get out of the military. Uh, Rick, do you want to talk about that? Like, Sure, absolutely. If you're thinking I mean, about staying it's, it's in or getting out, here are some things that you need to think about. It's, it's a personal decision for everybody and everybody's in a different situation. I'm a pilot. The airline industry is looking for pilots and hiring and going and finding a job if you want to go fly or whatnot is a lot easier than it was 10 years ago. You know, that may be a huge factor for somebody in the fact that, no, 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 that's all I want to go do. Um, so, you know, there may be a, there's a push and a pull. You know, is there something pulling you out of the military or is there something pushing you out of the military in the fact that I just don't really like what I'm doing in the military? And, um, you know, everybody has different factors, uh, in that. But I would say if you just feel like a little uncomfortable being in the military because it's hard work and deployments do wear down on you or whatnot, I think that's where the factor of well, things we just discussed today as to, um, well, okay, do, am I really looking at that benefit in the right lens of what I get out of the military versus out in the civilian side? Because you can't just go out in the civilian side and, uh, you know, think, uh, that you, it's going to be the same as the military financially, psychologically, physically, everything's going to be different when you leave the military. But 
uh, on the financial side that we're discussing here today, you, know, you do need to kind of have data, data driven points or whatnot it, to help you uh, make that decision. I think. I think for me, it's around the 12 year mark. And I'm not sure how different services are as far as like rank, rank progression and things like that. But for me, it's about the 12 year mark. If, if you're coming up on your half, half to retirement, meaning in the military, you can retire at 20 years for a pension and medical coverage forever. If you, so logical time, you think about like balancing age, energy, other things you might want to do. You might have a degree in something that you actually want to get out and use, which you're probably not using in the military career. Those things all come into play, but I usually have to, I think a reasonable choice is to like, think about your halfway point. Uh, you've got enough data at that point, you know, the lifestyle, you kind of, either you're good at what you do or you've or objectively, maybe you're not as good as you should be at that point in your career. We've all seen those kind of uh, people in the military too, just like in the civilian world, I'm sure. You know, you wonder how they got to their rank uh, and, you, and you probably know where you are in that hierarchy of effectiveness at what you do. Um, but yeah, around another 10 factor, mark, think about where you're going to get out. Go ahead. Yeah. Another factor on that too, uh, I'm, I'm trying to say the benefits of what's inside the military, and what, uh, but there's also benefits uh veteran, uh, the veteran affairs benefits that you have when you do leave the military. So, um, you know, take those factors into account. Also, uh, VA hospitals assist veterans all the time in, um, depending on your situation and what you, um, uh, can get benefits for. Um, but, um, I, I recommend there's a podcast on the, um, that's run by the VA. Uh, that's uh, online. You can Google it and they've got uh, a video chat and everything else where, you know, any kind of bit of information of VA benefits that you may have available to you, whether you served four years or 14 years, it, uh, it doesn't matter. There's B VA benefits out there uh, that may be available to you. Well, Rick, today we talked about the 10 money mistakes young adults make when they first get their consistent paychecks, whether that's military or civilian career, those were not contributing to their thrift savings plan or their 401k, not open up, opening up a Roth IRA, excessive disposable income spending, buying an expensive car, buying expensive recreational toys, co-signing loans and leases, loaning money to friends and family, lack of knowledge about credit scores, neglecting adequate insurance, and ignoring medical and other benefits that we get in the military. Thank you very much for talking this through with me. And it's good to catch up with you. It's been a while. Actually, this is the first time we've seen face-to-face -face, actually since, I don't know, what, two, three years, three years, at least three yeah. plus years. Yeah. Wow. It's been, mm -hmm. it's been a long time. Is there anything you'd like to share with the audience right now? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I'm a big reader. Uh, so I'll, I'll throw a, a book recommendation out there called The Psychology of Money. I have no connection to this book at all. Um, uh, I ran into it, uh, I think last year. It's by Morgan Housel. And uh, I almost felt like my parents wrote it. And the fact that uh, it was just kind of their same style of uh, how to look at money. But more importantly, I think that the psychology aspect of it, um, and I think this author is maybe more on that than really an investor type or it's not really an investment book. It's just kind of looking at um, um, how you should look at money and uh, everybody does look at money differently. And so very interesting book. Uh, and then just the time value of money. My dad told me in uh, when I was in high school, um, if you contribute to your IRA from age 20 to 30 uh, and then never put another dime into it, you'll have about the same amount of money than if you put, uh, max it out from age 30 to age 60. Um, and at age 60, you, you'd have about the same amount of money. So getting that early head start um, is a huge factor. And then I even did the numbers this morning where in that 10 years, if you 65, about 6,500 is what you can put into an IRA, $65,000 worth of investment from age 20 to 30, or do you want to invest $195,000 from age 30 to 60 to have the same amount of money at age 60? Um, that was always, that was an eye opener to me when he was uh, telling high school. And it really inspired me to, okay, when I get out there and I get that job or whatnot, like, uh, I'm going to start saving. And, um, 
uh, and it motivated me to do that. And then um, I see that in my accounts today. So, but yeah, thanks yeah, for having yeah. me on. This was fun. Uh, I was, uh, um, I'm, I'm glad uh, we could do this and uh, thanks for asking me to do it. Well, thank you very much for doing it. And thank you all for listening. Talk to you again soon.